I want to show you something I came up with this about, oh, must be two decades ago, about, you know, when you've not got much money and you need some marking gauges, you need some fancy ones, you don't need fancy ones. So what I want to do is show you how to make a wonderful gauge that I've used for a long time. It's got a sliding beam in here, you press it here, it locks the stock against the beam and you have your gauge. But what we're going to do is make a system of gauges. So what we do is we're going to work on making one of these. This is the stock and then we're going to make a system of using the beam. We're going to make seven different beams that will all fit into the same stock. So if you don't have a lot of time and a lot of money, you can make one of these and then you can make the additional pieces, the single pin for the marking gauge, the twin pins for mortise gauges, and then right on top of all of that, you've got this fellow, which is the one I've made and the one I'm gonna show you actually all the way through. This is the one we're gonna film now, but then I'm going to show you how to set up and make the others suit their purpose. So we will end up with uh, a quarter inch, five sixteenths, a three eighths, a half inch and a three quarter inch mortise gauge set to your chisels, not set to my chisels, not set to arbitrary sizes. You could do six millimeter chisels, you can do eight millimeter chisels if you're in the metric system. If you're in my system, you'll be using um, 5 sixteenths, quarter inch, whatever. I'm going to come up with those in a minute, but watch this and see if you don't enjoy it. So I'm going to start out by showing you the layout of the stock itself, because that's the most complicated part for now. Okay, we're ready to start laying out. And the first thing we're going to do is take the, the, uh, the block that's going to make the stock, the slidey part like this, that goes onto the gauge. We're going to make that first and uh, to do that what I want to do is show you how I arrived at the position for the hole. The hole actually goes through the center and what we need to do is take a straight edge like a ruler and make a line from corner to corner or from each corner to each corner across the middle. That will give us the pinpoint dead center of the gauge and I'm, what I'm going to do is mark it out in pencil but afterwards I'm going to go over it I'm doing both sides of this but afterwards I'm going to go across where the crosshairs meet with a knife to get that pinpoint accuracy that I want for the dead center of this so I'm accurate from the center point on this side is exactly the same as it is on this side. You could use a square and transfer it to the other side, but this will work perfectly. Oh, I have sized my piece uh, and I've made sure, I always use a vernier to get thicknesses right to make sure that I'm exactly what I need to be checking both sides. And that one, this one says 23, 22.36 and this one says 26. 0.33 so that is very accurate for handwork so we've got these sized and we're ready that's the first point I want to show you is how do you get that center point so from here now we're going to be boring a hole through here and what instead of just boring a hole through uh, with a brace and bit we're going to do a pilot hole through there first of all we're going to put it in the vise we're going to take a a drill bit with a 1 8 bit in it or smaller, something that will take the snail of the um, brace that we've got, the bit or the bit that we're going to use, that will have the tooth of the, the uh, thread on it that will pull itself through. So we'll be putting this, we're going to drill down about halfway through and then we're going to drill from the opposite side and that will meet in the middle. And if there is a slight out of squareness, the twist in the drill will pull itself to square and we'll get that perfect hole that goes right down the center perpendicular to this outside face and that's what we're searching for because that's what's going to guide the brace and bit when we start to bore the hole. What I'm doing here I'm taking the knife because the knife will give me the 
superb accuracy that I need. I'm just going across the middle with a knife line about a quarter of an inch long or something like that so it doesn't show after I've cut the hole. This is the crosshair of those two is exactly where I want to be to get the precision of the center. So I've made sure I've done everything I can to be accurate because this gauge needs to be accurate. No pressure. I like this kind of work though, don't you? Just take your time, be patient with yourself, give you time. And I'm taking a square hole and I'm even going to take a file to it and sharpen it because I want that accuracy again. So I rotate it on the flat faces like that. And that gives me, I hope it gives me, okay just insert the dot, the very pinpoint, don't press it too much, just lightly and when you see the dot is exactly on those two crosshairs, just press it down and then start to do a little rotation and that will create a conical inside there, or a cone should I say, right on there, lift it off, make sure it's as centered as you can probably get and then just nudge it over if you need to like I just did. So I came at an angle, brought it on the center, looked down on it and my eye told me that's perfect. So that's that and now I'm going to drill halfway through as I said. I'm just going to go in with the drill bit, one eighth bit for me. Stop. So I'm looking into that and I have got this dead on, it's perfect. I, I don't think I could do better. And then this one. Before I go all the way in, I'm just eyeballing and it looks good to me. And listen, now it should connect with the other half. There it was. So I let the bill, the twist now, I go all the way through and that will have light, that will have aligned. So if it was slightly out of square, it will have aligned it up because the rim is exactly where it needs to be. So I'm happy with that, put it in the vise and I'm going to bore all the way through now with a three quarter inch bit, a bracing bit. And that's because the stem is going to be made from a three quarter inch by three quarter inch piece. It may be slightly, slightly, ever so slightly bigger. So I start the boring bit now. Again, I'm only going to go halfway through, but there's something that I've got to do beforehand, which I am stopping now because I want to emphasize something. I'm actually not ready to bore this bit yet. I've got to lay out for something else. I have to lay out for this piece to go in, into the, um, I've got to get this perfect. So, because if this is slightly off, this slidey won't work. It won't lock, that mechanism will not work. So I'm, instead of boring this through now, I'm gonna hold off and I'm gonna show you how we lay out to get the precision that we want for this uh, sliding um, uh, lock bar to go in. So that's what we'll do now. Okay, now that we've got the position of the three quarter inch hole just described onto the surface there, I'm gonna take my square and line it up with the top of that arc of that circle. And I'm gonna take a knife here and I'm just going to make a nick on the corner. You can mark all the way across if you want to, go lightly if that's good like that. I'm going very lightly, just enough for me to see it 
although I doubt whether I will see it. And then from where that intersects the corner, right there, we're going to come down 3 sixteenths of an inch, which is right there. I'm going to transfer that now over to the other side. That's just going to be the rim. I'm actually going to be boring a hole through here. So where this, this line that was aligning with the top of here, that's actually going to be the center of a hole that I'm going to be boring through here. So let me, well, it's actually going to be, let me check, it's going to, we're going to be drilling a 7 16 hole, so it's going to be slightly off center, but it's going to be close to center. So I'll give you the exact size when I start doing it. Okay, so this line here is the top of the arc. This one is 3 16 lower down. And from this one, we're going to go up 7 30 seconds, which is exactly the distance I want. So there is my 7 30 seconds. And we can, instead of, we can just take that mark lock the square on to that mark there. That will be the center point for our 7 16 hole that we're gonna be pouring through. So I've got this side marked as well now. Stand it up on edge. And go into your knife nick. And just go ahead and mark it across the face with a light pass. I'm just doing more of a press in the midsection rather than on either side. Stand it up and do the same on this side into your knife nick and across that midsection there. And that there is the, the center of the 7 16 hole we're now going to bore through this way. So we want the dead center of that and we're going to use a marking gauge to get that dead center. And this has to be accurate. We've got to drill through from both, both sides and into a meet in the middle again. So just eyeball for center, first of all. Just press it somewhere near that line and then turn it around and see how good you were. And I am, oh man, I am so close. So there it is, I believe that's it. I'm right on that mark. And now I go in on this side. So I am dead centered on that. So when I turn it around, I know I'm centered. Go to this side, press it into that line. And of course you want it square going through this way, but you also want it square going through this way as well. So quite a challenge now, because we now have to bore a hole into here uh, and I'm going to put this in the vise. I'm going to just make that a little bit deeper with the all like that, and then into this one. And I'm going to stand it up in the vise because I find I work better this way. I know some of you will have a drill press, and this is actually ideal. If you've got a drill press, I would say go ahead and use it if you like to. It's just your choice. Okay, now we're going to dip in and out of this because we, we've got this hole to bore, but we can't bore the next one until we've made this. We've got to make the sliding pin because we're actually going to bore through this face, through this pin to get the exact arc and the position of the arc we need. So don't race ahead and start drilling holes too far in advance. So here now, ooh, this is where it gets a little bit scary. I do want it to be centered going across this way. So I have to rely on my intuition now. And I want it to be square all the way through. This is where it can go off quite quickly. So I don't want to go past, a little bit past halfway, 
but no more. I'm probably nowhere near that yet. But let's have a look. Just put the pencil in and see. Eh, not too far, a little bit more. It's like everything. It just takes a little bit of patience. So it's pulling itself in. Such a boring job this. Okay. So careful, very, very careful. Hard to correct this if you go way off. And it might be quicker. Aha, uh -huh. there I am, look. I think that was probably about as perfect as I could get it really. And I didn't do any cheating, but because it's sliding in so easily, uh, without bending the bit, I believe, I feel pretty good about what I did there. This is where the real test is, if I slide this in. And of course with a rat, rat tailed, um, file. I feel good about that. That's going to go. It just needs a little bit of um, a, a minor adjustment really. But I, I feel very good about that. I can go in with a little rat tail file or a round file and true that up a little bit more. But I've got this hole to bore through here yet. So if, I, if I've got to do that, that will correct some of that. And it could be just pure friction because once you go into the hole, there's a buildup of tightness that I've left in there. So it's gonna be great. Okay, now what we've got to do is we've got to make one of these. That's my next task, is to show you how to make one of these. And these are really great fun to make. So it doesn't take very long, just a little bit of skill. Now I've got a piece of oak that's three quarters of an inch square. I've kept it long because uh, it's going to be handy when you're cutting this stem, this sliding lock bar, uh, if you keep it long while you do the cutting and shaping of it because that way you can clamp it in the vise. So I've got, this is about 10 inches long, but you, you could make it just six inches and it would be fine. Actually, it's nearly 12 inches long, but I'm planning on making a spare one. It's always good to make a second one because they do wear out over a number of years. And if you had one already, made up, then you can lose it wherever you want to, which probably is what will happen with mine, but there you go. So what we're gonna do first of all, we're going to measure up from the end three inches of this, and then we're going to make a knife wall all the way around on that three inch mark to take us all the way onto each facet and that's going to be a shoulder line that we're actually going to cut to but we're only going to go very shallow it's only going to be maybe an eighth of an inch deep or something somewhere like that don't quote me until we get to this because i'll be giving you exact sizes either here or in a drawing so that's my overall shoulder line and then from there i'm going to measure three quarters of an inch which is going to give me the overall length of this when I actually cut it off. So I'm going to leave it in the length for now. It gives me a good hold in the vise when I'm doing my shaping. This cut line, you see I'm just rotating this and going off the face that's nearest to my stock of my square. I'm not following the normal protocols and it's come dead out and dead on. So there it is. That's what I've got to do now. We're going to bring you close in so you can see how I'm going to lay out the circular part to make the, the pinfold, the dowel that's going to go into the hole. But my next job is, I've got to put a circle on here. I don't know, you won't, if this is a little bit like a mushroom, so the stem is narrower than the top part, the overhanging part of the mushroom. So I've got to do the same on this one. What we do is we start out with the square section. So we've got to set a marking gauge so that we've got a, we're going to have a 7 16 diameter rod, this thing, this sliding 
lock bar that's going to pass into it. So the first thing we've got to do is find the center of this piece of wood. And we do that just the same way we did on the stock by drawing a pencil line from corner to corner. And that will give us a dead center of this piece of three quarter inch square stock. Then we take the awl and go right on that midsection. No, we don't. We don't need to do that. I'm getting ahead of myself because it, it depends on what we're going to do. I can use something that's got holes in it that are 7 16 and just place that over those two crosshairs or I can take the awl and put a mark right on that and then I can take the, this um, uh, these calipers and set those to 730 seconds and that will give me a 7 16 diameter uh, dowel or rod that will pass into it so we have a choice there if you don't have one of these you might have one of these and if you don't have one of these you could have some other compasses that will help you to get that whole or that uh, diameter exactly right so that's what I'm working on next so depending on, on which method you have access to, make a mark in the, on the crosshairs and set this to 730 seconds. Oops, there we go. That's 730 seconds right there. Drop it into the hole and describe the circle like that. And, and this is not rocket science at all, but it's just a question of getting... What we want is the outside walls. That's the reason we're doing this. I'm going to go over with this because I do have a 7 16 hole on this, and I'm going to eyeball that. I already have a wall now that I just marked with the gauge. So if I put this on here, and mark it with the pencil. I'll, I'll have something really black and white to look at. And to show you. Okay, I've got my bullseye. It's not quite on the center, but it's centered this way. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to just take my finger like that and ink that in a little bit darker. While I've got this setting, I'm going to go to this one, flip over, and go to this one. So now I can see pretty clearly where my lines are going to go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my marking gauge, and I'm going to take it and set it to the furthest point, just like that. That means I can use this to run gauge lines from that uh, three inch mark, I can run that all the way down to the end. So I take this and run a gauge line. I turn over and run a gauge line. Turn over and run a gauge line and flip over instead of turning over and run another gauge line. Then I turn it around and I run the gauge lines on the opposite faces like that and like that and like that and those are cut lines and I can cut down those with a hand saw with a tenon saw down to this stop line here and that's what I'm going to do next so if I put this in the vise here you'd be able to see what I'm doing. I don't have enough length on my tenon saw to go all the way. flip over and come from the other side. I 
Okay. And then we can do the opposite wall here. I'm not really too far off my shoulder. I'll go down this one. This one might get a little bit more awkwardness because it's so thin and the springiness in the oak. Nope, I'm good, I think. Down to your shoulder line. And then down this one. I don't have much to hold on to there now. Oops, it's easy. I went a little off track there. Fine, I think it's going on like this. Good. And then I cross cut these up to my line, so I need a Chisel of some kind. So, now then. Snug it right up against that shoulder line. Now of course these aren't going to pop off, these outside bits will, but that midsection if you remember didn't go all the way down so I just straight grained oak, no problem, just split cut and then go in with your chisel. And then do each face the same. I don't need to go in with the knife with the deepening the knife wall now because I've got that shoulder to work to. Very nice. Keep flipping it until we've gone all the way around. This is the fun bit when you see that, it just pops off. You've got that little half diamond in there, you just take your chisel and pair cut into it. So I've got my shoulder all the way around and you start to see what we've got when you put the two together, you start seeing how this is going to be formed from this. So I need this length, remember, don't cut it to length yet because now we've got to round this and that's what we do next. We've got some options for rounding this, but I'm going to go with my spoke shave. Flat bottom spoke shave, nothing special. And what I'm going to do is bring it up high enough to where the spoke shave isn't hitting the bench and I still have room for my hands. So my hands on either side and just start doing some pull-ups. This is your daily gym exercise. So we do some pull-ups and then we do, do some down presses into the shoulder 
and it will only leave a little bit down there so keep it parallel if you can and then just start rounding following that radius that you've marked on the end so I can see exactly where I'm going I'm keeping my pencil line the whole time and while I'm in this body position I turn it this way because it works very nicely so pull those even strokes until you just see it approaching your graphite line from your pencil there it is turn it round and go down the hill and do your bench presses oh not bench presses there it is so now we've got this beautiful half round uh, already done we've got half of it we just have to do the other half as near as we can get it same as now I would suggest that instead of going with the piece of wood with the hole in it you can use that just initially see there but what I would do is I would bore a hole in another piece of wood and that way you won't be wearing this hole out and you'll keep the accuracy of it but I can see the bruising on the corners here and that's what's subsequently going to guide me and then I bring in this little tool it's just a card scraper and I pull up like this and I bend it, I bend it so I can maximize the width of the cut which takes away the flatness so you don't end up with flatness work down like this pull up off the end all the way through and then you'll find that your um, your piece of wood is starting to mark it like that so now we've got some bruising on there that we can work to to guide all the cuts as we go down this stem all the way down to the shoulder a little bit more technique to show you yet but very nice isn't it so now that I've cut a, a hole in a piece of wood so I can offer the dowel part into the hole and I'm already in three quarters of an inch nearly and I can keep turning that and bruise that wood and it goes a little bit deeper every time then I come out go into the vise and I, I, I can either use the spoke shave like this which I like the idea of better then I can come back with the card scraper and work that piece of wood that way so I'm gonna this is the opposite side now so I do the same again how far we've got so and the other thing is not to forget we can use sandpaper too ultimately the scraper takes over from the spoke shave to further refine it and uh, improve it that's great look at this now we are cooking with gas okay when we get nearer to this shoulder we're going to switch to either a rasp or another tool and I think I'm going to do that now so you can see exactly what I mean before I do reach for the rasp, however, I'm going to take my chisel and I'm going to just check the grain direction, 
because now what I can do is I register the flat face of my chisel to this long, long axis here and I push into the corner and then I'm following the radius all the way around and this is going to get rid of the bulk of that waste now I'm, I'm feeling after which direction that grain is going because if it dives I have to go to a rasp pretty much it's hard to go with any other tool and uh, so I'm being careful come across the grain with the chisel like that pair down that shoulder because we didn't cut through this with the uh, saw did we <coughs> and that's the, the contrast there is the shoulder you can see, uh, well I can see anyway not necessarily you but I can feel this part is rounded following that and this is what I had before so I've taken these corners out and I'm going to do the same on this one exactly the same way so I feel after what that grain is giving me because um, if it nose dives I don't want it to nose dive because it'll weaken this juncture in the bar see there it's pulling me a little bit so I come back up take a little bit less a little bit less there we go now if you've got a 3 8 washer you could drive this into that or not 3 a 7 16 washer nearly got myself in trouble there um, you could drive this into that washer now and it would take this down to a perfect 7 16 diameter I just don't have that luxury so it's not hard to continue doing this see it hits that thick point there but I'm really not far off so a little bit more pairing or I could bring in something like this I could bring in this and I could just literally just do a little very light on the, the finest side because this has a, a coarse tooth and a fine tooth rotate it and take it down with this which is a little bit sledgehammer to crack a nut really but it does take it down muy rapido and, uh, I think it works quite well I think I probably would favour just going with the scraper most of all because that way but it, it, it worked fine that did I still have to go with the scraper though In with the block, with the hole in. Not very far off. I think I'm about three eighths from the uh, three quarters from the stem. A little bit of clean up in the inside corner, and I think I'll be there. This is taking off the equivalent of a plane stroke. So there we are, we are cooking with gas. There it is, we're down to the shoulder line. A little bit of clean up on this inside corner with a chisel and I'm ready to take you through the next step.
almost there now. Uh, there's one last step, and that is to take a piece of abrasive paper. I've got some abrasive cloth back paper, but some paper works just fine. And you can pull this now and it will even further enhance the rounded part. And generally I wouldn't advocate this for other things because of course it's a cross grain sand which shows in the final. But on this it's just fine. Oops. So once you've got it very, very close, we want it to fit onto there pretty much like that. So we want to do a little bit of refining, but not too much now. I look for the bruising, I take my scraper, apply it to the bruised area. It's not bruising, it's more a shiny area really. Nice, eh? Did you enjoy that? I am hoping you loved it. Because I did. So that now brings us up to the next stage where we slide this inside the, the hole. Like this. Make sure it fits. Make sure it goes all the way up to the shoulder, just like that, which it is. And then we can drill through this and through this at the same time. And that's what's going to give us the perfect marriage. And that's the next step. Now that we've got this pegged, as it were, um, what we want to do is uh, Enter it in the hole, and we're going to drill a hole. We're going to take that um, three quarter inch bit now and put it back in the brace. And we're going to bore through the, uh, the middle of the stock and also through the, uh, uh, the um, the sliding lock bar. Um, but what we want to do, we want to make sure that this is protruding through the hole about 3 16 of an inch. That works fine. So I'm just coming out 3 16 on the outside so that when I bore through here, that will be the start of the arc. And then as I slide this in, it's going to tighten up because it has a, a sloping uh, just a slope going into that curve and that's what tightens it on the lock bar but we want to make sure that this aligns with the face of this so it's just a question of eyeballing it twisting it to where it needs to be and that way when we put the mushroom in it'll be aligned with the faces of the stock of the gauge. So we clamp this in the vise now and we do the boring bit yet again. last little detail we're going to create the sliding part so I'm starting three quarters of an inch from this rim point here to where I start my cut just like that
And if you have a, a small rasp, as I do, you can go onto that slope like this and just refine it. But if you don't have one, don't worry because guess what works just as well? A little flat piece of uncomplicated steel. Just pull that into so you get a smooth transition from the arc into that long incline. That is, that is that finished. So when you look inside, I don't know if you can see, but when you slide this inside, the incline hits the top of the stem, just like that and locks it in place. The next step that I've got to do is uh, I've got to shape, at the moment I just have a round hole. And then um, what we want is square sides at the bottom of the hole and a slight radius on there. It's not that slight, I think it's um, one and three quarters. But what, the reason we have that is it cradles the, uh, the bar. This is the shape of the bar. When it goes into here, it seems to lock it down and seat it better than a square edge. Um, I don't know if that's true, but it seems to do exactly what I want it to do. So I'm continuing with that tradition. There was a reason they put it in there on the original uh, marking gauges. Almost all marking gauges have this radius on the bottom and I believe it's so it cradles it so that when you put the pressure on the top bar it seats in there uh, and keeps it in a permanent position when it's locked down. So that's what we're doing next. So the first thing I've got to do is um, is do the layout for it. It's not complicated. It's, I'm going to use one of these. If you don't have one of these, you do need something that will give you a one and three quarter inch radius that you can place on there. And you could use as I, this is much bigger than the, than that radius, but you could use something like that, a small tin, uh, the lid off a, a, a sauce bottle or something like that that will give you that radius. So. Or you could simply go to one of these, set the distance between the two to seven eighths of an inch. But the problem with it is you, you end up putting a dot in your material. But that would work too if you wanted to use a compass, that would be fine. What I want to do is I want to um, show you some of the things that I found beneficial to laying out this. So we want to make sure that we don't radius the wrong part. This is the top of the gauge here. So this fits with that confirmation from the radius that we made on the inside of the uh, sliding locking bar. So we want a radius on the bottom. I've just put a faint line in there. Um, but um, and that line actually on my um, the end of my uh, ruler is that one and three quarter inch radius. So I could just use that. That would be fine. But just in case you, you don't have that, I've got also got this, which has a one and three quarter inch radius somewhere on here. There it is. This is my one and three quarter inch radius is here. So um, I can use that just fine. So what I'm first of all going to do is I'm going to use the square just to run some square lines down the side of the exact width of the, the hole like that on both sides and that's going to give me a visual so that I'm working in the right direction. And then on the bottom of the radius I'm going to make a square line. You have to position your square so you maximize the length of the stock here against the um, longest part there. Okay, now I've got those lines on. This is already finished. I don't have anything else to do here. Those lines have to go on the other side, so I may as well do that now while I'm in that layout mode there. Up the side again. It would be terrible if you uh, did the shaping on one side and then shaped it on the top on the other because the distance from the end of the hole 
is the same top and bottom at the moment. Well, it will be always. Okay, so that's what we've got. This is not what we want. We want to do some shaping in there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make a center line on, on this piece. So that means one and one eighth, because this is two and a quarter material. And one and one eighth here. And that center line goes from top to bottom. Lost my center line now. There it is. There's my center line. You could use a knife if you want to, but remember knife marks are permanent. Once I've got that, I have a center line on my strip, on my, um, my uh, template here. So I'm gonna bring that to that one and three quarter mark and line that center line up onto my piece of wood on the center line underneath. And that way I can mark the radius exactly. But what I'm gonna do while I've got this, I found it very helpful to go in with a knife at this point and make a knife wall too, that I could work to. Try not to cut my template and ruin it, but. That's where the end of the ruler worked very well as well. So I've got that knife wall and that will serve to drop my, I have a 3 16 chisel, which is very nice for this. Um, but a quarter inch chisel will do it, but not quite as nicely. But I can't give you a quarter inch chisel. Not from here anyway. I mean a 3 16 chisel. Hopefully you've got one or you've got something. You know, I often, in the past, I've made um, uh, cuttings, uh, cutting chisels from just a piece of steel without a handle and use that. So you might consider that if you're up for that. Okay, make sure we're doing the radius in the right place. One and three quarters. Well, when I was an apprentice, it was always one and three daughters. Okay, there we, whoops, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Hang on, did I get that one right? I did, thankfully. It's easy to go off piste and uh, end up marking something the, the wrong way, or the wrong side with all these arches on here. Never seen so many arches. Okay, there we go, one and two, like that. So I've got my knife wall there. I will probably go in now and put a knife wall on the edge of the rim of the hole as well while I'm here, just to meet that internal corner. Uh, and that, that will stop the, f the surface fibers from splitting above when we start chopping these little corners out. So that's a, just a, a good idea. I thought it was brilliant, but there you go. Okay. You'll enjoy this little bit. This does not take very much at all. Um, so... What does take a little bit of time is fitting the stem to the hole. And remember, you've got seven to do. But I'll show you what I did, and it worked great. So that's it. I'm really ready now just to chop this. As I said, I've got a narrower chisel that will help me to drop on there. Of course, it's, the chisel is going to create flats, but they are so close together you barely see them and I wouldn't worry about that because you can always go in with a very fine rasp if you've got one and you can use that to uh, clean up the seating area of the bar hole the stem hole there you go so that's it don't underestimate the, um, the necessity for accuracy when you start on these and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this a little bit away from that knife wall first of all, about um, 
Oh, as much as a sixteenth, but maybe a thirty-second would work. I've got it nice and secure in the vise. Now that lifted the, the material up to the knife wall, so I'm angling my chisel just away, working either side, and I'm I'm using the knife walls to drop my ch the knife wall on the long grain one. I'm going with the grain. I drop my chisel right into the knife wall there because I've already weakened this fibre on the end. And now I'm in my knife wall with the chisel corner right in the corner where the two lines meet. And I'm chopping and I'm going to go about halfway through. Now I'm checking my alignment I'm listening, feeling the whole time, prepared to change the angle of approach. This goes so easily and of course mesquite is very a very brittle wood so it, it um, there I'm in that knife wall again so I've got two little flats really and actually that's going to be fine because I'm going to refine it in a minute. Halfway down, remember. Looking good. And now the other side. I'm going to do this side. I think I'm in my knife wall sometimes. So I want to be away from the knife wall first of all. Side wall. I feel like I'm doing an operation here and I'm describing my actions, which I suppose I am in a way. Just not human underneath this chisel edge, thankfully. Okay, so now I go directly into that knife wall and I get the precision I want. This next bit is where we take that same chisel and we start to refine the meeting level of the two halves just very carefully. Now I've choked up on my chisel with my fingers like this so that I don't overshoot and shoot into that opposite side and break those unsupported fibres on the outside edge because it would look ugly and I would feel bad. So just teasing out the, the teasing that chisel edge into those surface fibres a little bit and work from both sides in is what I'm saying so that so that you meet somewhere in the middle. If you were slightly hollow inside, it would be fine, although I do 
always steer away from encouraging that. Now if you have a a, a small, a narrow rasp that fits inside there, or a file even, uh, you could use it, That's that would be fine. I, I, would, I wouldn't have any problem with that, like, much like I have one, you see, so as long as you go very gently, especially rasps tend to pull the outside fibres. But I'm telling you, if you took a piece of wood like this and just shaped one edge of it, um, it would work just as well, if not better. So I'm going to take a, a rough plane here and make a radius. And it can be a smaller radius than the one of the actual hole, like that. Now this piece is quite a long piece, but if I took this now Cut that off. And wrap the sandpaper around that radius. Put it back in the vise like this. Try not to rock, try to go very steadily inside the hole and keep it as straight as you can and just follow the radius just like that and that will refine the bottom of the hole beautifully i think that works fine when you're refining the inside of the hole what i've done is i've got that radius that i just showed you how to make but you can also take some double-sided tape as i would and, and uh, put it on the wood and then add the sandpaper, the abrasive paper to that wood, it will give you that arch. But also on the underside I've got a flat corner and that's very useful to get inside the corners uh, on the side uh, areas just to refine that so that you have this nice uh, crisp clean inside um, try not to go into the arches because you want those you want to go from the flat into the arch and down the other side as cleanly and as neatly as you can but that's what I would do I would make some little paddles that will help you they take just seconds well maybe a minute or two to make add the double sided tape the mounting tape not the soft one just the film put that on the surface take your abrasive paper press it onto it trim the sides and you can refine the hole inside there without going to the expense of buying more files, special files or rasps. If you wanted to do that for the top there on the radius, you could just take a three quarter inch dowel and then reduce the size, the thickness of the abrasive paper and use that on that. But you probably won't need that because it should come, come cleanly off the auger bit when you bore the hole. So now I've got my hole um, refined as much as I need to. Now I'm going to show you how we make the stem that goes inside this hole because that then moves us on to preparing for the points, whatever we're going to do. I'm going to be making the complicated one. So I'm going to take one of these square shafts that I've got here and uh, I'm going to actually cut the mortise hole to take the, uh, the, the stem of the cutting gauge uh, or the, or the, to take the, the cutter and the wedge before I do any shaping because it's much harder if you have a round on the top and a round on the bottom to get the holes exactly where the mortise hole where it exactly needs to be and that crispness is critical to that wedge being exact so we're going to do that next.
Now we're going to fit the, um, the square stem to the hole and it's got to be sized fairly precisely so what we have to do I've left my wood although I think on the um, the details it said it was a three quarter inch by three quarter inch stem but I left it a 64 no not a 64 maybe a 30 second oversized so that I could actually fit it directly to the hole just in case you know you start working on these holes and they get bigger and bigger and wider and wider and before you know it you need the extra material mine is fine it's just still that uh, difference over size so what I've got to do what I did first of all is I planed up one face planed up the next face checked it for square even though we're going to be putting a radius on there it's good to have these reference faces um, uh, square and, and reference faces that you can really work to and um, and then what I did is I just sized it to the hole that's what I or that's what I would do is size it to the hole now sounds like I did it but I did do a couple so I've got already got a couple prepared um, and I'm going to drop this in the vise now and take a couple of swipes with the plate take it out and just try one end up against the hole and then the other end I need to take more so I just keep going down like that because one extra stroke can be one extra stroke too much and it can make everything a little too thin, undersized. And that's the last thing we want. Now if you're fortunate enough to work on this majestic wood called mesquite, that just dropped in there. If you, can, if you do have a piece of mesquite that you can make this system from, you are truly blessed. But one of the benefits of it is most people associate mesquite with barbecue wood, which is a very fine thing. If you're a barbecue fanatic, that's fine. And I'm going to reset my plane now and just take off the heavy set that I had, just to refine this surface a little bit more. Because it's just exactly the right width now. But I just need a little bit. So now it's actually going inside the hole it should go in on both sides if I've done my work right so if you've got mesquite you should start getting the essence of mesquite the smell of mesquite there is no equal to on the face of the earth it's the most wonderful smell whether you use it for barbecue or not it's an amazing smell okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to round the top to fit into the top section which is a direct three quarter inch diameter radius no, no diameter the radius is going to be 3 8 isn't it so we can use again I can use this if I want to find the 3 quarter inch drop it on here line it up with the very top come so and draw that radius in there I don't need a knife wall just draw it in there and I've got it and then I do the same on the other end and then I'm going to plane this just like we would a bullnose on the edge of a box top or something like that I'll walk you through it, you're going to enjoy it going to do next is um, we're going to uh, actually cut the wedge shape because that's the what we place against the the stem here to get the exact angle that we need when we cut the mortise because it's going to taper from being wide on the top on the dome on the top down to the underside and it tapers from top to bottom so I need um, my wedge is going to be 5 16 at the top 3 16 at the bottom one and three quarter inches long and all I'm going to do is use a knife to lay it out, cut that wedge shape first uh, without refining it or shaping it in any way. So that's what I will do now, I'll show you how I get there. 
To lay out for the wedge, we're going to very simply use a knife and a ruler to, let me find my ruler, where did I put that? Hmm. I've lost it, so I'll use the one on my square. So I'm going to I'm going to measure from this uh, planed edge here that I've got three sixteenths first there and then five sixteenths up at this top edge top edge of the wedge and then just take a straight edge and join the two. And I'm thinking this uh, knife is going to give me a crisper, cleaner edge to work to. So, so that I've got the edge I want, the mark I want. And I'll, cr I'll just cut that in the vise now. Tough stuff, this is. Very tough. got this in this position I'm just gonna clamp it and take a shaving off it although this is so smooth from the saw curve I don't want to spend a lot of time on that check myself make sure it's parallel to the opposite face and it looks good and that's it that's my wedge made. I'm going to, while I've got it in my hand, I'm just going to take my block plane and just take a shaving off the corner just to take off those um, hard corners. And that's my wedge done. So now I can start laying out for the mortise hole. Okay, for this next step, it's quite simple. We're going to determine which is the top. So this is why we marked the radius on the end so we wouldn't make a mistake. So we would have this as a reference point. So this is the top, this is the edge that's going to have the cutter in it and we're gonna measure from the end. And I'm gonna mark everything with a knife probably. So I'm coming in from the end a half inch and just making a mark. Now while I've got that there, I am going to make a distance, I have to determine what the distance is from here for the width of the mortise hole. So I'm going to square the line across the top. So this is the top of the dome and we're actually going to be uh, radiusing this. So any mark we put on here is going to disappear. So we don't need to go heavily. So I've got that half inch mark and then I mark it onto this corner just for now. So if I make the mark a nick there like that, and then I take my wedge and I place it against that nick there. Well, we'll have to, I'll have to place it and then move because I want to bring in the cutter. This is the cutter. This is one eight thick. Now that's very thick for a, a cutting gauge. I don't need it that thick. It's just happened to be a piece of steel that I had, but you could go down quite a bit smaller than that. And from that half inch nick that we put in there, 
we want to make a mark on this side. Let me just press those together. It's a little bit tricky and trying to hold them both together. Now the wedge is flush with the bottom of the stem. I'll give you a quick glimpse at that in a second. So there's my nick and I'm coming in this side here and making another nick. That's going to mark the position of the mortise hole. So I've got those two marks there. And then this, this mark, uh, the second mark, the one I just marked, should I say here, this one is the second mark. This was the point where I started to do the mark. And this one here is going to be squared onto the top and it's also going to be squared on the underside of the square. So let me put my knife in that nick and move across the top. Just doing that midsection about the five six, the, the three, um, three sixteenths chisel. Then I take that nick, that one, and I make the nick onto this corner because I want my uh, blade to be dead square, parallel, should I say, to the stock of the square when I run it. Okay, so now I've got this point, I've got this point, I've got this distance marked, and at this point I can bring in this and this together, and that combined twosome gives me the position for the underside of the mortise hole. So you can see it's really quite exact this. Now I wouldn't worry too much about it. You probably will chop this exactly where it needs to be. But if it went a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, you can make those micro adjustments after. So there now I've got my, I've got my lines on here. I've got my lines on here. And that means all I've got to do now is set up the gauge to run the parallel lines. And that's what I'll do after this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to um, set the mortise gauge in the, just the standard method, which is to take the chisel you're going to use to chop the mortise and place it right between the two conical points so that it's just inside the tips of the points and then we take that and we center that on the stem, on the piece of wood. So we press it into the wood here and then we turn it around to see indeed if those points are in the right position. In this case they are. And so then I can run my gauge line here, flip it end for end, just in case there's a discrepancy and do the same from here. That gives me the wall that I need and now I'm going to chop through that midsection and I'll show you a little trick on the way to help because this is a very small mortise hole so we're going to do something that you probably have never seen me do before something I don't like to do but I'm going to do it in this case let me see if I can pencil those in a little bit so you can see them And, and we find out, we make sure that we register the gauge against the same edge. So that if there is a minor discrepancy in the setting, you will still be parallel. That'll do. Now I'm ready for chopping the mortise.
staying away from that end wall because the fibers will compress. Once I've gone in, I can move up to that end wall now, knowing that those fibers are now solidly impressed into themselves. This really doesn't take much doing, so tease out the fibers, try and keep the walls crisp. Now, the one that's square, the wall that's square is this one that I'm in now. This is square from one side to the other. This one is the narrow side, this one is the top side, so it tapers on that one side. And that's important for us to realize because otherwise we'll be chopping square down. So. The one that's on the inside is going to be the square one. I'm going to start from this side now and do just the same right in between those gauge lines. Work along just with hand pressure works fine. I'm in that knife nick then so I'll go back to this other side just to deepen a little bit more. That just gives me that wall on either side for when I really start chopping with a little bit more gusto. So this one I've gone at an angle because it's going to be angled. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just move this here because it's more centered in the vise. Because I can feel a little vibration there. So I've taken off the bulk of the meat on that side. So now I can chop with impunity because I'm not gonna move that knife wall. I want this, this is the wall that's going to be square from top to bottom. Now because this is such a small mortise hole, I'm going to use a drill just to drill out a little bit down the center of this uh, mortise because it'll, it'll uh, give a place for the material as I chop. It'll give a place for that material to go to. So just about any size of bit. I don't, it doesn't need to be sized to the opening. I'm a little bit under that size. So I'm gonna go halfway through from this side, like this. And then come through all the way from the other side into this one because that will give me that extra space for the material to go to. There it is. I, I don't like that method. People are always asking me whether I use a, an auger or a drill to remove the bulk of the waste and I really, really don't like it never have it always feels so awkward and ugly so I'm going down here and I'm going to go down this wall and down this one now and this is the wide point so I need to angle my chisel away from me and then pull those fibers into that waste area just like that 
I'm going to check myself for the width. Here's another piece of wood that's the same. See, I'm all I'm over, a little over halfway, so that's great. Turn over. Now come from the other side. Up against the knife wall. And I'll feel this go through in a minute. This is angled away from me at the top because this is the underside. So it's actually the other way. Not what it matters much. Just twist that chisel a little bit just to nudge the fibres in the right direction. Little hand pressure down the walls. And I'm going to use the drill again just to lift out the fibres. Otherwise it's tempting to lean against the end and we don't really want to do that. So I'm just about to break through I think. So this is the top face. Now I'm pulling the chisel just to get the, the width equal across. That will clean up the knife wall. Moves the chisel backwards and forwards, which isn't that easy. It's nice and tight, so it's self supporting in that mortise hole, which is a good sign. Clean up the corners. And let's see if we're close. There is my cutter. There is my wedge. So I'm a little bit thick on my wedge yet, so I've got to plane a little bit off the wedge or take it off the hole, and I'd rather take it off the wedge. So that's just, to, I've got another wedge here. I can put those two in the vise, probably, and just plane up the one. Boing. Yeah, that'll work. I just have to work out how I'm going to do it. Very small. smaller fingers. It's amazing the things you do just to get a crisp clean edge, isn't it? It's close. A little bit more. 
Here's another method, but you've got to watch your fingernails. It's a good way of trimming your fingernails. We definitely do not want it tight, otherwise it will always be a strain to get it out. Close, very close. So that's how we fit the wedge. Fun, isn't it? Great. I'll finish that off and then uh, we'll get back together. Here I'm using the plane to round the front of the stem by altering the angle slightly with every stroke. Next, I'm using a straight card scraper, but I'm flexing it slightly to blend the curve. Then I blend and smooth everything together with sandpaper. The back of the stem also has a slight radius, and here I am marking that directly from the hole for a perfect match. The process of rounding, smoothing and sanding is very similar to what I just did on the front. Now I can test the stem into the hole to test the fit. I want a smooth operation for the gauge, so I make small adjustments as needed to make sure it will run smoothly. Now I can finally test the locking mechanism. Now I can move on to shaping the stock. Here I am using a rasp thingy I picked up a while back, but a regular rasp works just fine. I use a flat file to refine the finish. Onto the locking stem. I cut this off but leave some of the square stock in place. I am going for a squared off mushroom look for the end of the locking stem. I start this by marking some centre lines and then making a sketch of the shape. Then I cut off the excess wood using the saw and then shape using the rasp and file again. That's two sides done. Now I want the other two to match.
We are pretty much there. This is starting to feel like a marking gauge. Now it's the little finessing details that make this such a lovely gauge to use. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to find the exact centre on this piece of wood and I'm going to find it using the gauge, the marking gauge, because that way I can make a mark on the end of this to align this jig to. So the gauge line that went through the centre of the pin I've now put onto the very end of this piece so I know it's dead centre and I'm going to centre this gauge so that I get the centre pin exactly in the middle because I want this to be as accurate as is humanly possible by me uh, because it just needs to look right it wouldn't matter really technically if it was off centre but what does technically matter? What matters is how I feel about it when I've made it and that's the most important thing. So I'm ready to put my uh, pin into this piece so I'm marking it here I don't know why because all I need is a mark on the end just to guide me and this is going to be removed after because I've got to shape the end of this yet and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to align this line which is centered on the pin with this line on the top of there this distance is half an inch from the end this is a marking gauge not the mortise gauge there'll be different marks for those so that's what I'm doing now I'm going to uh, now clamp these together in the vise and bore through the pair of them at the same time still using this um, pin that I filed the uh, four corners on and drilling through the whole lot so this one because this is square will align it with the other piece of wood and it will go through the two just fine so make sure you're fully aligned with that piece you've got the end piece on I'm going to go with, I've made two pins, I made the short one which is actually going to make the pin that goes into the final edition of this. So I'm going to use this shorter version first to go into that second piece of wood, the actual stem that I'm going to be making and then I'll go with the longer one because this pin is not long enough to go through both pieces of wood. In and out, give it time to breathe. And that mosquito is very hard. Uh oh. And it turned loose on me. Hang on a second. Be careful. These do get very hot because of the friction as well. I'm going to switch pieces of wood, uh, pieces of metal. This is a longer one now. go all the way through this time.
very, very, very last bit of shaping we've got to do on this is to round the ends of the stem and it doesn't really matter what the radius is if you need to have a guide you could just take the end of a ruler a steel rule which will have a round end on there almost certainly and you could mark it with that but my suggestion is that you just go freehand with a rasp if you've got one if not some abrasive paper and just a couple of swipes up like that once you've got an, uh, uh, an angle of about 30 degrees start lifting the rasp onto the end turn it around and do the same from this side so one two three four five something like that six strokes if it's a good rasp and then up onto the end and look for that continuous sweep last bit is just to take a the file sorry about the nose I can go lower in the vise and get rid of it but I don't really mind it so it is counterproductive that vibration go up onto the end and there it is it looks very nice to me I've got my round done and then just take the file and rub across the corners in a continuous sweep like that till you've gone all the way around it and then you've got a nice aris on the side it shouldn't need sanding that's the last bit I've got the other end to do and then all I've got to do is sharpen the pin which I'm going to do next to show you I'll finish this end off and then we'll get back together for the very final bit which will be shaping and inserting the pin so there we have it this is how we make these beautiful gauges so very nice very happy you made me a happy man if you've watched this all the way through because it's quite a long session but a beautiful piece of work when you've done you'll enjoy it great This is how we sharpen the point and um, I've got a couple of pins now uh, but what we do is we we've got the pyramid point and we can, can we can use the very point that we ended up with there as the finish point but what we do is we just elongate that and work it around just like this held in the uh, vice clamp like this it'll work just work it around you're just taking off any hard points just to start with like that and then of course we want to refine it uh, if you go too shallow on this then you'll end up with a weaker point but I've got my point where I want it to be so I can release this from the clamp and then I'm going to chuck it into a, a drill driver just like this oops like that and then what we're going to do is we're simply going to attach some abrasive like this and this is just and I'm going to spin this onto the abrasive like that so I'll show you that next give me a minute I'm just going to chuck it into the vise and keep it in there 
and that's basically all I need. So I can just take the drill now and move it along. Keep it moving. Just like that. And that gives the tip a very nice uh, shape. And then go to a finer grit. I've got 150 there. You can go to a, uh, a 250, 300, something like that. 250 and 300 is plenty. That's more than enough. So that's the very last little bit that I've got to do. A little bit more abrasive onto a block of wood. Take care when you're doing this. Think of safety. Think of your own personal safety. This takes very little on this abrasive level. So I'm just going to go to the two, 250 now. Like that. And there I've got a pristine point. Now watch it, it does get hot. But I've got a very nice point on my um, tip now and that is ready to be inserted into my gauge. Very nice. A little bit of cleanup now, just to put stuff away. I'm almost ready for that. I'll be glad this series is done because it means I can clean up and put things in order. Not that they're disorderly, just need straightening up a bit. So I've got my pin to insert now. Um, before I do that, this is the only finish that I'm going to use on my gauges and on my stem is going to be some uh, it's just simple really, it's just going to be furniture polish, you could use beeswax, something like that, but just furniture polish along the stem and on the stock, the wedge, the uh, cross member, you don't need any on the uh, sliding tommy bar, on the sliding to uh, tension bar when you put that in, the locking bar, because uh, especially where the wedge is, because that could cause it to slip. Uh, and I would use, if you're going to put anything on there, I would just use some rosin that you would get for a violin bow to create friction between that part, which is what I do. And um, so that's it, basically, just some furniture polish, some very simple soft polish onto these surfaces, and uh, and we're good to go. And then. Once that's done, there's really nothing else to do this. Put the furniture polish on, buff it with a shoe shine brush or a soft cloth, and it will look beautiful. This is looking stunning because I use mesquite. mesquite. I've made these out of walnut, maple, cherry, all manner of wood, paduke. I've used all, all kinds of woods to make these from, and they all look good. And I have even made one out of pine at one time because I was desperate, I didn't have a marking gauge and I made one. It wasn't exactly the same as this. I just did one with a wedge that slipped in the side that held the stem to where I wanted it. Uh, but that was 30 years ago. So there we have it, that's that bit. So we've got the wax on, this slides in. We put our locking bar in put our stem in and the only thing left now to insert is going to be the pin and that simply goes in like this but what we do is we chuck it in the drill like this and we spin it into the, the hole like that then we release it like that and there we have a very beautiful, very, very beautiful 
marking gauge that works like nothing else. <laughs> Don't you just love that? So we're ready to uh, shape the top of the bar, the stem. Uh, make sure you get the right one because you've got your mortise hole cut in there and it tapers in one direction from wide to narrow. But that was the idea of putting that mark on the end. So we're going to lock this into the clamp here. Just like that. Cinch it tight and in this case the, uh, the two, the head and the uh, shoe actually go in the vise in my case because my vise is too big to take it, just the bar in there. Then we take, I'm going to use a scrub plane to take off the bulk of this waste. I'm just staying slightly away from my line. And then I'm going to angle over like this, just so I take off as much waste wood as I can. That saves work on the next plane here. And now I'm taking off those hard corners left by the scrub plane and working onto that top face. Just like that. You can take a, a scraper like this and bend it into the surface. So I'm bending it quite considerably and that means I'll have zero flats in there and zero hard corners. But I'm not actually fitting it to the opening yet. I'm working just to my line, to the arch on the end. Now I'll do the other side. Just the same way. Now I'm ready to take the, uh, the arc that we created in the bottom of there and transfer it onto the end of my stem. So I clamp it in the vise, good sharp pencil, line it up right with the very top so that there's no gap and then you can plane to the arc that you mark on the inside. Do the same on the opposite end and then you can work to both ends and then the bit in between just gets straightened between those two points. What we do as well is we pull a line from that uh, end of the arcs just to guide us when we clamp this in the vise now we can um, we can plane it to that stop point there. Now we've got the underside to shape. So exactly the same procedure. This one takes so little time, this bit. I hope you're enjoying watching this because I'm enjoying Pulling this together for you, it's been great. Back to my scrub again. This does save a lot of work, well worth making. Or should I say converting? Close to your line. And then a little bit of refining. And actually I did find, um, I use a little block plane now and again on, on this, like this one here, they're handy. I don't really care for them very much, but for this kind of work, they're very pleasant to use. But I wouldn't run out and buy one, because number four will do everything you want really. Let me 
I'll give that a bit of a shot and see how close I am. Pretty good. Very close. So a little bit of scraping, maybe a little bit more planing and a tiny bit of scraping. I think we're going to get this together. The scraper really is very beneficial in this, especially these thin, flexible ones. When you start pulling or pushing this, it just flattens out the curve or refines the curve, really. need a little corner off this hump here, it's got a little high spot. We detect, we work as a detective really because we're looking for those points of contact really, it's kind of forensic. There we go. So, very, very close now. A little bit more on that end. Not much, really. Almost you could sand it now without using the scraper. I'm going off the end like that and hitting the, this plywood here so it's not hurting my scraper, it's not hitting any metal. And I've got a feeling, oh there we go again, dropped it. That is so close. I'm looking at the shiny bits on the wood to tell me where to remove the stock. So close. Oh, there we go. Maybe. Uh -huh. Ah, the problem is right inside here. I think. It really was and a little bit there, and we've got it. I think I'm close enough now. I just need to sand this because I've not really sanded it much, and that sanding will reduce the diameter sufficient. So 150 grit. all the way along and then you can go to finer if you want to, I probably will not it's practical to have it a little bit less smooth Let's give it a shot now and see what we got Definitely close enough now. Happy with that. I'm now ready to start shaping the top and the bottom and um, these have different radii. So the top one is seven and a half and the bottom one is, uh, no sorry, wrong way around. The top one is four and three quarters. The bottom one is seven and a half. So I've got both of those on my template here so I can use the template to get the arcing and I'm just placing this right on my center line that's still in place flush at the top and pulling that line around and it's just a guide and it's not critical to the P 
piece and then turn it the other way up so I've got the bottom in place I'm centering it on my center line flush at the bottom and then pulling my lines around there so I've got both marked on there I'm flipping over and I'm doing the same on the opposite side and the reason I'm doing that is because I can work to those lines from both sides if I need to I doubt whether I would actually need to but the lines are there just in case and that means I can now start shaping these arches that's going to be great simple ready to cut the um, slide locking bar to length and that's nothing to that we're going to do that and we're actually going to uh, cut it to length and then we'll be ready to shape it as well so just in the vise <coughs> cut through I've got enough to make another couple of Tommy bars out of that and another sliding lock bars because uh, these don't last forever and um, you, you can't really turn it over and cut a notch in the other side because it gets too thin but now you know how to make one five minutes ten minutes to make one that's all it takes so you could either keep that little chunk of wood in your drawer somewhere or you could make another one now and have done with it then in five years time ten years time when you need to replace it you've got it ready in stock so that's it that's that part done now we've just got to shape this end part, you could shape it to whatever you want, hexagonal, you could round, you could put little thumb pieces in it, you can do whatever you like on yours, but I've decided I'm going to go with that four-sided mushroom shape that I think I have already showed you, and if I didn't, you'll see it in a minute when I make this one. So that's where I'm going with this. To, to shape this, this four-sided mushroom, Thing. I just took my pen, I'm just going to take my pencil, find the center, eyeball for center, eyeball for center, and then down on each side, on all four faces, that will just give you a meeting point to cut to, because we're going to shape this just like this, we're going to freehand it, you could use a template if you want to, just to get an arc on there. Now there's no point doing all four sides because you won't be able to see all four sides because you're going to cut off 
if you mark it now you'll be cutting it out cutting it off so I'm just shaping that uh, to the shape I want I'll bring you in close so you can take a look at that what I did it's quicker to just cut the waste wood off with a saw the bulk of it until you can go in with a rasp or a file or whatever and I would probably just put this in the vise here so it's near the corner of the vise locked in to the vise and then take a rasp I'm going to use the Shinto but not on the coarse side I'm going to use the fine side and I just want a gentle curve over towards the centre of the top but I want the top to be comfortable for when I press this so that's about as close as I would go with it for now and then bring in the file like this and just refine it flip over and do the same again I've got it resting on the vise the, this chunky head is resting on the vise so I hope you can see that gently gently this Shinto rasp can be quite aggressive or is it you being aggressive it does have an aggressive tooth cut so but it, it cuts very nicely, it cuts smoothly, really, if you're careful. Bring it up a little bit and get that top. All the things you've learned in this project should bless you, I think. And of course now we have lost our centre line so we just go back in, pick up the centre line, mark it on like that and now we can come and we can mark this side and this side just roughly back in the vise like that and then just cut this corner off. So nice, this is, I love this kind of work, don't you? You feel like you're in control. I've known people that will use a router and set up a jig to carry the router on something like this. Three hours of uh, creating a jig for a few minutes work. Ooh, not for me. Coming, you can see it coming together now, can't you? And this file, this is a, a 10 inch Baco file, and it's so beautiful, it cuts so nicely wood, steel, brass. Just about anything you turn to offer. And then, just on these corners, just take the file and run it up to the top. It'll just soften that on your fingers. I don't think I'd bother sanding that for sure. A little erasing there, that's all. Nice, very nice. So that now goes into the stock like that and I can slide 
hopefully. The bar in like that. I'm pretty happy with that now. There it is, it's locked, it's already locked without any more refining. It's perfect, I think it's perfect. What I want to show you next is how I made a, a drill. It's just a simple procedure, I do this all the time. I can use a nail to make a drill size the exact size of the nail. And what we do is we just lock the bar stock. I've just got some bar stock that I bought. This is actually piano wire, two millimeter diameter uh, piano wire. It's just under two mil, but it's close enough. And you can go down to one and a half millimeters. That would be plenty. Going bigger than two mil was a little bulky. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, uh, the file and we're going to file a pyramid point on here. So we're going to do one face, flip over, do the opposite face, half a dozen strokes, whatever it takes to get to the center of the bar. Then we turn it on its side, a few strokes, turn over and do the same from the other side. And we'll end up with a pyramid point going to a round. And those corners on that will ream out a perfect sized hole to the diameter of this piece of steel. And that's what we rely on. We're relying on that friction fit because it's very difficult to find a, uh, a drill bit that will suit the size of the steel. It's some very odd size, uh, a two millimeter, the wire, the piano wire is a very odd size. So, um, but you can buy the, the wire the, uh, from a hobby shop, somewhere like that. You can buy a big coil of, of piano wire that size, anywhere between one and a half and two millimeters will do. So I'm gonna start filing this and I'm gonna, I've got this piece of wood in the vise. I lay my steel bar rod on there and I just file one and a half a dozen strokes, whatever it takes to get a flat on there, halfway down the thickness of the bar. Flip over and do the same again. And what you end up with is, is a chisel point on there. It's just a flat chisel point and we're going to go a little bit further and do the other two sides as well. One, two, and now it looks like they exactly what I wanted, a, a point, and I can use that, I can put that in the drill, and I can start using that to drill holes with it, and that's what I want this for, because this is going to drill the hole in a guide, and then it's going to drill a hole for the actual pin that goes into the finished product. Uh, so we're going to go through that next. Now that we've seen um, how to make the single pin marking gauge and the uh, cutting gauge, uh, I've got two stocks, I've been making different stocks, but you still only need one stock. So, and what we can do now, I'm gonna show you how to lay out for the uh, twin pinned ones that make the mortise gauge set. So we're gonna, I'm going to have a quarter inch, a five sixteenths, a three eighths, a half inch and a three quarter inch. And I'm gonna lay that out on that same piece of wood where we bored the single pin hole through I'm now going to bore through the other holes that I need for the twin pin. So from this core, this uh, single pin hole, I'm now going to drill a hole exactly to my quarter inch chisel distance away. And then from that second hole, I'm going to do the 5 sixteenths. And from that hole, I'm going to do the 3 eighths. And from that hole, the half inch. And from that hole, the three quarter inch because I want them to be distanced exactly to each chisel. I can't take it from one datum point because the holes will be too close together. So we're going to do that next. I'm going to walk you through that. It's not complicated. You just need enough sticks of wood to work with. So I, I need five sticks. That's what's going to give me the five extra gauge um, uh, shafts that I need. So 
that's where I'm going with this and that's what I want you to do too because then you've got a full set of uh, a complement if you like of of stems that will give you all you need for mortising for the rest of your life probably and the other thing is you can always add a special um, stock in four or five eighths chisel or four or five sixteenths ch uh, three sixteenths chisel and even down to one eighth if you want to you can do all of these things with this and it's just nice to have as a complementary set I think so I hope you'll enjoy it don't shape them keep them in the square because that gives you the exactness you need for getting those pins aligned right along that center line. I've got all my chisels ready, I've got my uh, chisels laid out on the bench, good to go. I've got my sticks of wood, but I'm not ready to do anything yet. I need the chisels to mark out the distances on my piece of wood. What I'm going to do is I'm going to offer this to the uh, previous cross grain wall, knife wall that I did that's going to mark the side of the chisel. So I'll take this, I'll take my knife and I'll mark the side of that one. Then I'll take the, I'll drill that hole and then just in case it slips off center and then I'm going to take the next size chisel and do the same. I'm going to work along and drill all of my holes. Then I'm ready to attach the piece of wood to that piece and then I can drill through and I've got my holes on the go then so I'm going to walk you through that now and you'll have to cl come in close to see that because it's going to be very precise that's what we're, we're searching for we want the exactness of that um, chisel distance and, and uh, if you wanted to you could move your pins slightly off at the uh, a little bit wider than the chisel by maybe mm, such a small amount of paper thinness or something like that because you can of course uh, your chisel will wallow out the size of the the mortise hole when you start cutting it always makes the mortise hole slightly bigger and therefore you need a tenon that is slightly wider so you can do that I'm going to shoot for dead on accuracy because I can always widen or do what I want to later when I'm actually in the zone cutting the mortise and tenon to fit and as you know if you've watched any of my videos you will know that I use a router to refine a fat tenon. I usually cut the tenons a little bit fatter by a fraction of an inch and then go in to refine that surface with my router and that is the Paul Sellers technique because it's something I've used for two or three decades and I never learned it from anybody else and I never saw anybody else do it. Now everybody does it, does it. so that's great, that's what I wanted. So we're going to do this, it's the same method for boring the hole, the knife wall all the way to the opposite side, boring through from both sides, meeting in the middle so we get the exactness that we want. I extended my gauge line from that single pin further along so I can use the same center line and I've also marked the the center, the side of the piece of wood so that when I place it against this line I no longer have to have a center line on, on my piece of wood on my stem so I've done that just to make it easier for me. So here's what we're going to do, I'm going to take the smaller chisel, this is the quarter inch, I'm going to use that first and I'm going to take a square and my knife and I'm just going to lay my chisel directly on the uh, original cross grain cut line so that I can get the exact mark right there. Then I'm going to take my square and just go across the grain like that. That's the dead center. Now I make a nick on the corner as I've done before like that and then stand it up on end and transfer that knife nick to the opposite corner there and this I, I am then confident that I've gone on the opposite side as an exact marrying level point of course then we go with the uh, the all and get this point dead on those lines. I need to put a gauge line further along this side. There, that looks good. 
And the reason I keep pulling it out and going back in is because you can be slightly off centre and the best thing is to check yourself before you go deeper. So now I'm going deeper because I'm more confident that I am in line. And um, yeah, I need to bring that uh, gauge line on this side further along. So I'm ready to drill that hole and I'm going to drill it. I'm not going to mark them all. I'm going to drill this in case I shunt off slightly then I wouldn't be able to use this one or this one if I'd already bored them. So I'm going to bore those holes now with my four-sided piece and, uh, and that's how I'm going to do it. Now I'm ready for the 5 16 one. So a knife right on the side of that chisel. Knife nick on the corner. Knife nick on the opposite side. And you should always remember, if you were slightly off, it, you know, I'm talking very slightly, it probably wouldn't matter that much because a mortise hole is often slightly off. But what we're always striving for is that, that accuracy every time so I'm I'm not admin I'm not uh, uh, encouraging inaccuracy here in any way And so we continue along uh, with the next sizes. I don't need to keep repeating this for you. Now I place this against this one, mark the next, and then I go along until I've done my three quarter. So now that we've got those holes bored, it's just a question of getting the different stems, deciding on which one you're doing, flushing the end, Lining it up with that mark on the side that I told you about, that parallel line to get it parallel and square. And then centering it on, and having it centered on the stock, you clamp it in the vise, flush the end, and then take your drill bit, your handmade, homemade drill bit, and then drill that hole. And you can go from one side Now it's going to get hot, so be careful with your bit. And you can take, once you have this, say halfway through, you can take this off and that will give you a place for the waste wood to come out then, because of course it's not a drill bit as we know it. There we go. Align it back up, put the pin through the hole to get the two aligned again, like this. Once it's aligned and you're sure it's aligned along its length, cinch it back into the vise. Put the drill into that same hole you just did to make sure that you're lined up. 
and then go in for the second pass for that second pin. This is how we spin the steel pin in. Turn it loose. And now you can tap this pin to whatever distance you want. And I'm just going to insert the second pin. This one has not been refined yet, but just to show you how it looks. basically. Just like that. So cut them to the same length and you've got your twin pointed uh, mortise gauge. Isn't that great? You can polish out your um, needle points on a strop, just on a piece of leather, and just after you've sanded it, abraded it, maybe 250, 350, 500, something like that, if you want to, you can polish it and polish it, and that's what you'll end up with, is this pin. And what I'm gonna do next is, I'm going to um, heat treat this, I'm gonna stick it straight into a burn, into a flame, a torch, heat it to cherry red, and then plunge it into water in this case. You can cut your pins to the same length just with a pair of pliers. At least I think you can. I did one, it worked fine. Yeah, it's coming now. Just roll it around once it's made the indent it'll snap no it won't i'll have to do a little bit more be careful because when you pop this with the pliers it does um spring out of the uh and then you can file the ends and get them nice and level and uh, insert them. Great, sorry you see in the back of my hand more than the pins here. So a little bit of filing on that, heat treatment and we're done. I just came out for a little bit of heat treatment for the safety side of it, I don't want to put the flame inside my workshop garage. So I'm just going to heat the points for these um, marking gauge pins. And that's just holding it into the flame, holding them, I've got two in this vice clamp, just hold them into the flame till they go red, it's just a matter of a few seconds. Use the tip of the flame. I want the stem to be hardened most of the way along, about halfway. And now I'm ready to plunge. And now I can polish them out again. They've got the oxidation off on there, the blue and such.
So here's the proof of the pudding. I've got my pins exactly right, exactly where I want them. Perfect. And then if you just tap, that loosens, you set your distance, flip over, tap again, and then there are the gauge lines. Proof of the pudding. And it moves, it slides so beautifully along the edge of the wood. So there we have it, that's it. What a beautiful tool that is, isn't it? Look, 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 it's so lovely. Very nice, I'm really happy with this. So I just have the other four to do to get the full set, the complement of stocks. And you may, uh, of, um, gauges but and you may want to make two or three more gauges uh, stocks now that you know how to do it and then you can make a rack for them stand them up in the rack and you have your gauges on their way here's one i made out of maple quite nice isn't it really single pin we're on our way aren't we guys